My name is Sarab Dayal Singh and today is July 21st, 2015. 17 and I was then living in Delhi, Motiba. Back at that time, the media was very much controlled by the government of India. So around end of May, we started to hear that the army is moving. We lived in Delhi, which uh, Delhi cantonment area was very close to us. So any moment from Delhi, you could just feel it where we were. So we were like, you know, something is happening, but it's like, what's going to happen? How it's going to be done or what they are looking at? Nobody had any idea. And I think June 1st or 2nd, they started to announce that army is taking over and, you know, at the Golden Temple complex and asking people to get out of there. And they, the original things that I heard and remember is that we're going to be peacefully taking the militants out of the Agal uh, <coughs> Darbar Sahib complex from uh, from the uh, sorry from the Darbar Sahib complex, but that's what was like you know we'll peacefully bring them down and we will we'll take them in the custody. And uh, slowly, then few days later, next day they started to show some videos of their side that as they entered the complex, they were bombed and this and that and they lost of li lots of lives and everything and then they started their propaganda showing that oh we you know have all these arms and ammunition that was stockpiled at the Darbar Sahib complex and uh, <clears throat> they just started to show all the Sikh military leaders they had him all the way on top and uh, they just started to show the propaganda that oh we are we are flushing all the terrorists out of there and we are they are giving us a big resistance and we are fighting and that's what they started to do. And I think June fifth or sixth is when they when they said that oh we killed uh, uh, son General Singh Ji and they were showing his body and they're saying that this moment is completely wiped out. There's no more terrorists. They were not showing the damage at that time to the complex or anything. Their cameras were giving exposure but on a limited places. That's what they wanted to show. And they were they were they were making it look like that really if you if you believe the government at that time and then there was no other media out that they did a thing that was asked for or that was, you know, called for, but it was not the truth. I had doubts, and that's not like only I had doubts. Any, man, any you know, person down there had doubts. But it was so controlled that before 84, before that happened, they have put laws together where they had put any foreigners restricted area. Even the Indians that are not, they don't belong to Punjab, they didn't have a permanent residence in Punjab, like we were, we were not allowed to go to Punjab, like, is it the same part of the country or is it a foreign country? There were no visas also, but there are special permissions. So people, they, they have, they, it was not just happened that week, it was planned for few years. All the Tata uh, Terrorist and Dis Disruptive Act, and so they had instituted those to, in a very planned way, and so much in advance, that but they were so secretive about it that you couldn't figure out what they wanted to do. But they were doing that in like, you know, progression of time. And that's what they did. So this was their big show and they were showing it off that, oh, we, were, we, we, were, we just suddenly came along and we found out that these stockpiles of weapons and these terrorists are hiding and we took them out. But a normal person in, in Delhi, Hindu or Sikh or anybody, they were not believing it that, that that's what happened. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have any other information. No, I didn't visit the Bar Sahib until probably what, 90, uh, I think 98, 99 or maybe mm -hmm. later. I, you know, that happened in 84 and 1989 I moved here and in between there was still media in, in India was still very restrictive and everything. There was not much of the information, all the information were one-sided. So we 
could not find the actual extent or actually what happened. Even we, today we don't know. But we have a lot more sources. We have a lot more information. It's not just what the government says is there. So it's, it's like in, after 89 when moved here, we had to start to find out. Most of it happened when the, when the internet came up. Yeah. People have putting their own homemade videos, pictures, and those kind of things. When they started to pop up, then you can you have to piece them together. It's still not a complete picture. It's a it's a puzzle that's uh, you know you still piece them together. But that's what you find out that it's not what the government said. It's not what they are saying even today. Mm -hmm. It's just what they wanted to do, and they were they were planning to do, and they did it. I, you know, this is, these are the few days that even after 30 years, so 31 years approximately, I can still visualize in my mind. Uh, you know, my college was quite a distance from my place, but 17, 18 kilometers, which for Delhi is a big distance. So I was there on the, on the morning of 31st, and we heard the news early morning that Indira Gandhi got shot dead and not shot dead, sorry, shot at and she's very critical. So at that time the first news or so did not have any mention of anything, who was the shooters and what happened, nothing. But soon after that, probably maybe half an hour later, they started to say very clearly that his sick bodyguards, so they, they killed him, they, they shot at him, at her and she is in the hospital. So hearing the news in there, everything, all businesses, offices, they started to close, even though there was no official announcement that she's dead, or, but it's just the anticipation that she's shot at a very close range. So she's probably not gonna survive. So the thing started to close. Our college administration also decided that it's not in the best interest, you know, students are there. So they just said, go home. So we we coming back and it happened to be All India Medical Institute where she was taken for treatment or whatever you know they were trying to was the hub where I would have to change a bus mm -hmm. and we were outside that and the and the amount of police and everything that was taking over because that's one of the biggest hospitals in Delhi and it's always so full and they were just a lot of security was around it. We got off there, we were four or five friends, we got up there from one bus, waited for the other bus, got the other bus, came back home. So I think about noon, I was back home. And then we were just taking it easy. Everybody was glued to the radio and the TV and they were just doing their song and dance. Finally, I think around 1 or 1.30 they announced, maybe earlier, they announced that she is dead now and uh, but the official announcement because the president was out of the country and they were waiting for him to return he was on his way back hearing the news so official announcement won't come until later but then that's what they were saying that you know she's dead but official announcement waiting for the official announcement in India at that time if a prime minister or any president acts or current dies the radio stations, TVs, everything will go to a somber music. They won't play the regular programs that they play. Everything gets cancelled and they just go to that music thing. And that's what was happening whole day. And then uh, I was out in our area. It doesn't look like anything is happening. You know, it looked like normal life. So around, I think, 4 o'clock or 4.30, one of our neighbor came. And she told that she heard that there's a mob collecting at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. That's where her body is and that's where mob is collecting. And maybe a few people there just because of the emotions they are, you know. So my brother, Gurdial, he had left to go for an IGS meeting in South X, which is passing the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. So he went and nobody was, just normal thing. So he went past, so he saw the people were burning buses and everything. He was at, at a, got off the bus at South X and at a gas station or at a place, somebody come to him and said, Sadarji, run out of here because they are killing Sadars. 
and he was looking around there was a gentleman filling up his car and he told him come on in my car and then he and he asked him where are you from so he said okay don't worry he came around he didn't come straight which was the shortest route he came around and brought him to close to the home and dropped him there and at by that time we were hearing the news but we were not we did not place that where would he be or this and that but he was safe and sound and then my dad was still at work which was uh, at the uh, uh, main you know close to the parliament and then we were we were worried that you know what's going to happen so we were just taking our bikes and going to the bus stop and see you know next bus and so he came in he was also he knew the information so he was a little early so he came in by 6 o'clock and to being a, a place in motibag which is a government colony it was much safer so but it looked like that is it's not an easy thing maybe we everybody thought there's few people who are just taking their emotions out so in few hours police will come and it will go away so that's that's what people were thinking but then uh they started to close all the businesses and everything officially they announced it that she's dead and as the night start to go in we heard there's a big mob came it at gurdwara moti bag which is just across the street from us and it has a big gate so somebody in his presence of mind was able to close that big gate before the mob get into the gurdwara and then because it was right on ring road it was a big explosive gurdwara it's not bangla sahib it was so big enough so the street police station was close by so they were there was a taxi stand right next door which was owned by six they burned few taxis over there and then that mob went away and then the local people they just got together over local association <clears throat> they said we are hearing this news so all the six in the you know area just stay put and we'll start the you know night watch and that kind of stuff and they did that so but next day what we started to hear again the whole thing they were showing on the tv for next four days was his body lying in there and make arrangements for it there was nothing not a big news of what's happening they'll just show bits and pieces oh this thing is happening at that place this thing is happening in that place there's police to cover it and this and that so i think after fourth or fifth we had army moved in our area and we were wondering what's happening so then find out they put curfew in there they are trying to clamp it after his body was after his funeral was done until the funeral was done there was no control they were not controlling anything but there was no news so i think on 5th or 6th uh when it felt like that is is calm down the situation is under control so as we you know young guys we started to you know go out and trying to find out what's happened <clears throat> so first thing i did with few of my friends we went to palam colony and this is 3 or 4 days after the main thing happened but you could still smell burning bodies in that area you could still see blood on the streets i didn't see a complete body but you could see there was some body parts in there and then we went to the local gurdwara and find out that it was completely burnt it was burnt like like it was not just somebody just took a little fire it was like you put a lot of kerosene or whatever you did this was burned very badly so then we started to take and there was no government in sight taking care of it they were saying that people are in the camps we started to find out where those camps are we went there to ask people the story was you could not hear it how the people were dragged burned killed rotted it was that you couldn't you couldn't believe it that that's what happened and this was just one place palam colony that you know <clears throat> so we we were we were like taken aback a lot i had couple of my hindu friends with me and they couldn't even believe it that this happened and 
any place you go, people are actually at that time, the local people are scared of us that we are, we are coming for a revenge or anything, but we were trying to see what was happening. So then there was Sikh organization started to go for it. There is appeal for all the funds and this and that. So that the thing was, do we take care of the people who died or do we take care of the people who survived? So I spent a few days helping in the camps, getting, you know, I was, I was not that at that time was the person that I would talk to people. I would just hear them, but I won't ask any questions. I think I just, I would just want to see, you know, if I can get something for them, get them to that thing, but not. So it was, it was long few days. But then as the news start to come from other places in Delhi and you start to hear, I never visited any other place, but it was even worse. Mm -hmm. The trains and everything, it was, it was worse. All of our friends and relatives, they were physically safe. They were, there was nobody died or anything. Uh, we had cousins, their house was looted, but they had a Hindu uh, renter in there. Their three-story house in middle, second floor was that guy. So they didn't burn the house, but they looted it badly. And there was the other family close by who took them away from there. I had a uh, couple of friends in Palom. Uh, they lost uh, two of the family members. And uh, one was, uh, I think, 14 or 15 year old. He survived by cutting his hairs. My friend, uh, he was out of town. His elder brother and his father died in there. And he was out of town. He was uh, not in there. So his younger brother, they cut his hair and he survived. Then we had some neighbors who used to live to us. They moved to Tilaknagar. And uh, there were there were small communities around Telugnagar. There was a lot of loss was there. They were all had to uh, cut their hairs. Five members of the family. Their house was completely burnt, but they survived. They were uh, one of them was beaten very badly, but he survived. He had uh, I think uh, nose broken and everything. And they they call it their lucky break. Whatever happened, these guys, they pulled them out on the street and this and that. And there was one of these isolated police officer. He, it, it may be that it's just by accident. He had a, he did a fire in the air or something. So the mob kind of little and they, they just left them and went and that gave enough chance for these people to get out of there but their other neighbors and everything, nobody survived. The, the, the first thing that happened after 1st June and then November 84 was that you completely lost the faith in the system. You we were like, you know, is this system capable of, six have done so much for the country and now they are, and it's, as you, as you start to get the information, it's, it's like, you could just feel it, it's planned. It's not just happened, it's the mob just didn't show up. They planned it, they, they executed it. I heard from people that they were planning that attack on actually a few days later on Guru Nanak Dev Ji's birthday. They were planning the, the attack against the Sikhs. Not sure if it's confirmed or not. So they have already prepared for it. But this happened just a few days before. So they, they had all the planning, everything ready. So they executed it at that time. I think Gunan Deji's birthday was November 7th or 8th, something like that. It was not that far. So they, that's what I had heard. But once you heard all the stories and everything, it was completely planned event. It just didn't happen. So the main thing that happens is that you completely lost all your faith in the system. And then it takes you back that what are we doing here? Forget your protection and everything. You know, that's your foremost thing, but forget that. Is it, are they even, are we even in, in accepted in there? So there were two sides of the coin where you have all your friend circle and everything. And some of them were, no, it's wrong, mm -hmm. it's wrong. Other one was completely tight-lipped. They won't say it's wrong, no, the government is doing, you know, taking the terrorists out and this and that. But when you ask them the questions, 
how come they, if they said that they're taking the terrorists out, how come they allowed them in the first place? And why couldn't they wait on? There are a lot of other peaceful means they could have done it. Why couldn't they wait on to those, mm-hmm. you know, things? Why didn't they, if they were so, so critical about it, why didn't they ask for some international monitoring, helping? Okay, you know, we have this problem, UN and other things are there, but they didn't do any of that. So then they would say, oh no, why don't we have to bring the foreign countries in over affairs and this and that. So mm-hmm. they were all full of, you know, yeah. excuses. Yeah. So the, the main thing is then you lose the faith in the system. I look at healing at two, at two levels. One is people like me who have seen this thing, who have experienced it, and seen it closely also, not very closely, but closely enough that they the, the healing process is different. And then the people who actually suffered, there are still there's some movies made and some uh, progress done where the, uh, the actual people who suffered 30 years later has no way of getting any justice. So for, for us, the lesson we learned is that we have to take care of ourselves first. We can't rely on all this thing. Even after 30 years when they say the press is very open in India, they are still not covering sick events, they are still not covering the, the plight of the Sikhs. Uh, you know, we have to fight for even people who've been completed their sentences, they're still not out. So that's, looking at that, the main thing is that we have to make sure that we can take care of ourselves. And I know one thing, that politically, we have to get strong. We, we haven't, even after 30 years, we cannot say that we have taken that step. Mm-hmm. And the second thing that we have to do is, the, the, the money that we donate and we put it in there, we got to put that to the right use, of course, Taking care of the needy is the biggest thing. But we have to start using that money towards our political gains also. There are things that you can do by money in the political section that in the justice side you have to fight a lot to get that. So, but we are still not doing it. So we have to come together. That's one thing. We are still not together. That's unfortunate, we're still not together. We haven't, uh, you know, taken one strong stand that this, this is injustice and we have to get justice for it. But uh, that's what we have to do. We have to get it to a point where we can use the things for our political needs.